Thank you, Barry. Okay. Yeah, okay, well, let's uh, proceed. We're kind of bringing up uh, Dr. Dow's daylight back in Georgia. So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, and I think he's already fairly well introduced uh, and integrated at this point. But Dr. Zhao is from Taiwan. He received his Bachelor of Science in Physics from Suchow University and his doctorate in astronomy from Georgia State University, where he is now a staff astronomer. His research mainly focuses on all aspects of low mass stars, including determining fundamental stellar parameters, studying multiplicities and finding exoplanets around them, plus making high precision astrometric observations. Uh, in his work, he has used a variety of amazing telescopes. I'm kind of just blown away by this from the small aperture 0.9 meter telescope, the Cerro Tololo Inter American Observatory in Chile, to the large eight meter Gemini observatories at Mauna Kea, which we talked about just a minute ago, as well as space-based telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, Kepler, and test missions. He's logged more than 1600 hours of on-site observing while everyone else is sleeping. And I guess after uh, you finish your talk tonight, you're probably gonna go right to work, it sounds like. <laughs> Uh, lately, his research has been awarded by NASA's inaugural high-risk, high-impact blue ribbon panel to study stars close to the gap on the main sequence. Enjoys hiking, which is one of my favorite things. I did some of that today. Listening to music and watching baseball. So go Braves and go Dr. Zhao. So okay. the session uh, is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Myron. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, mm -hmm. Should be able to. There you go. Yep. Good. You see the screen? Yeah, we have it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Reverend Wong. So uh, today I will talk about astrometry. So this is a, a, not a very popular uh, field in, uh, in astronomy right now. Uh, because uh, because of this uh, telescope, <laughs> uh, Gaia. So uh, most of the results I present today are from are from uh, uh, this uh, telescope. So first, uh, first I need to uh, thank my uh, collaborators. Uh, uh, without, without them, uh, I couldn't do this project. And also uh, thanks for, for the, the funding agency, which is NASA at ADAP program, and also the Blue Ribbon Panel. Uh, they uh, select my uh, proposal to be funded. So here's a little uh, uh, in, uh, overview outline for this talk. Uh, first one is introduction and uh, all things about astrometry. And then talk about the Gaia and what we have learned from Gaia and a little bit of future about my, my, my project, a current project. All right, I assume all of you uh, have seen uh, Milky Way. Uh, so this is what, uh, you know, you know, beautiful uh, cloudiness uh, sky. That's what we see, uh, beautiful Milky Way. And uh, uh, so we have a lot of questions we need to answer uh, since uh, you know human being running around on the surface of the Earth. So, so these are the three most popular questions we ask ourselves, right? How big is the universe? Uh, what is out there? And are we alone? So these are the three uh, big questions. You know, uh, many many astronomers try to solve. But before we answer uh, answering all these questions. Uh, we have to know one thing, which is a distance. Uh, this is the, one of the fundamental uh, uh, parameters in astronomy we, we, we need to determine. Once we determine the distance, we can extrapolate a lot, a lot of science out of it. So, but in order to determine the distance, we must have an accurate uh, coordinate. And as well as time, the, the stellar coordinate and the times kind of a hand in hand, they are related. And uh, all these, uh, lead up to uh, a field uh, in astronomy called astrometry. This is, as I said earlier, is not a very popular term um, in, astronomy, in, astronomy, in astronomy. So uh, they are uh, related. So first, before we talk about distance, I need mean, to spend a little bit of time to yeah. talk about time. Can you do the like banking stuff so, like So time here. Uh, as we know, right, many of you may have yes. traveled to uh, uh, London, uh, to the Greenwich. Uh, uh, it's different. Uh, well, it's totally different. Let's see. Could the audience mute their microphones, please? Aaron Napola. Yeah, sorry. 
So here is the you know uh, the longitude and the, and the latitude on, on the Earth. So and uh, when we define uh, the prime uh, uh, meridians, basically we set up the time uh, on, on the Earth. So it's quite an interesting. Uh, the question is how we set up the uh, uh, prime meridian in the first place, right? So here's a quick picture. This is the Royal uh, Observatory in, in Greenwich, is in London. Um, if you haven't been there, uh, so uh, hopefully this is one of your uh, on your uh, list. Uh, one day you can travel there to visit uh, this site. So this is where the, uh, the zero degree is. We define a zero uh, degree for the prime meridian. And uh, right behind this glasses is this, um, uh, oh, um, before that, this is me, right? Standing across the, <laughs> uh, the zero degree line. Uh, I, I, of course, I'm not as excited uh, as these guys uh, do some crazy stunt there, uh, but uh, I'm pretty happy. So behind that uh, piece of glasses, this is the uh, uh, area transit circle, or you can say is a transit uh, telescope. Uh, what they did back then is they tried to determine uh, the timing, uh, the time. Uh, so basically, this is the, uh, uh, east, uh, uh, the east, this is west. So the, the stars move in this direction, I believe. Uh, so they will uh, re record the time when the star pass uh, the meridian. So basically you have to record the time and also record the um, um, uh, tilted angle of, the, of this telescope. So basically the zero degrees is defined in this, um, at the crosshair in these eyepieces. So once they determine the, the coordinate pretty well, so they can determine where this uh, um, uh, north-south line is. So that's how we determine the, uh, the prime meridian. So uh, here's a kind of a um, side talk. I will not uh, talk about a lot of this. Uh, so I will give you homework to do. Uh, so to learn a little bit about uh, the Longitude Act. So by, uh, back in uh, 1714, uh, the Queen uh, made an announcement. Basically, they tried to determine you know, how a, a sailor, uh, once they are on the boat, how they determine the longitude, how far they travel um, in the direction of the longitude. But in, in the north-south, it's pretty easy, right? We can see the, the, the north stars, for example. We can know uh, the sailors knows uh, how, far, how, how far north they, 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 they sail. But in terms of the time, right, it's really hard. So they, had, they initiate this uh, longitude act, uh, how to deter, deter, determine the time. So I'll leave this uh, to you as a homework. Uh, so you, it's a pretty interesting story. Uh, about uh, the Longitude Act and how uh, the guy called the John Morrison uh, um, uh, sort of uh, um, designed the clock so that we, we use, uh, we can use uh, kind of a portable. So once we determine the um, uh, prime meridian, so that means we have we must have an accurate uh, uh, stellar coordinates. So sort of we extend the, the coordinate system to the sky, so we have a selection sphere. Right, so we have a right ascension and a declination. So the right ascension also, you know, uh, in, in terms of time, right? So this is a uh, 360 degrees. So as we have a, uh, you know, uh, so it's uh, so it's 24 hours, right? So as we can know uh, how much time uh, we, we, uh, the Earth rotate. So that is uh, kind of a fundamental uh, uh, in in terms of uh, astrometry. So. So stellar uh, precise stellar coordinates are very important. So in this one is a, a, a star uh, atlas, right? So for example, in here, we have a, a right ascension is 21 hours. So if we look at the, the um, uh, when these stars pass the meridians, the hour angle has to be kind of a zero, uh, zero minutes, uh, zero seconds, right? Because these stars, uh, this, these stars along this line past the meridian. And uh, because we must have an accurate uh, coordinate, so let's say this, uh, using this one as example, this one is at the 21 uh, hours, then 10 minutes. So that means, it, well, 10 minutes after this, this line, so these stars will pass through the meridian. So, uh, so again, so the coordinate, um, the precise coordinates are very important in, uh, in astronomy. 
So, so this is kind of a, a backwards. So uh, what is astrometry? So basically is a branch of astronomy that dealt with uh, measurements of positions and movements. So this is the positions. The other is movements because movements and positions kind of hand in hand, right? Once the stars move one, from one position to the other, so we know how fast they move across the sky. So that, uh, that's the um, uh, kind of a, 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 a fundamental for you know, uh, astrometry. So once we have a coordinate, we can determine the distance uh, of a star. So speaking of distance, we must uh, uh, mention this uh, fellow here is a Frederick uh, uh, Bessel. Uh, we all know um, in mathematics, he has a very important uh, uh, Bessel functions as is shown here in this uh, uh, German stamp. But he also um, uh, contributed a lot in astronomy. That's why he has two titles here. One is astronomers, the other is mathematicians. So what did he do? So basically he measured the first uh, trigonometric parallax uh, to a nearby star, which is 61 Cygnix AB. So I'm sure you're familiar with the constellation, right? So this uh, 61 uh, Cygni AB is right there. It's not pretty bright, but pretty nearby. So the proper motion is about 5.1 arc seconds per year. Uh, the uh, visual magnitude is about six. Uh, the parallax he measured back in 1838 is uh, 314 million r seconds. So it's not too far from the, the true value um, recorded uh, in Gaia, uh, 286. So it's quite amazing. Uh, so this star is the eighth uh, fastest uh, uh, star, moving star in the sky. It's also the 13th closest system um, in the solar neighborhood. So. He, he, he measured the first uh, parallax. So of course, it's not accurate, but it's close enough. Right, how do we measure parallaxes? Uh, we use these techniques every day, right? Uh, the human, uh, we have two eyeballs, right? That's how we can see depth. The same thing with this uh, colorfish. Uh, it's quite cool um, uh, videos. Uh, some university did some experiment. They allowed the colorfish to wear 3D glasses then it, it then change the depth of a uh, shrimp. So they, they, um, so they, they can see, uh, um, they can simulate uh, the shrimp, the distance from the codfish so they can do kind of experiment. So he also used uh, the depth to catch uh, uh, his prey. So here is another homework for you. Just uh, YouTube this uh, codfish experiment. You just search uh, codfish 3D glasses. I think that's, um, the first one or two uh, uh, YouTube videos. It's quite, quite interesting. All right, so next one is how we measure the trigonometric uh, parallax. Basically, we use this, um, uh, again, it's a pretty old technique, right? So the, because the Earth rotates around the sun, so when the nearby stars um, uh, in our field of view, uh, its location kind of shift relative to uh, background stars, which are very far away. So for example, in July, this is the one of the nearby stars. So we look at, so its position is right there. And the six months after the earth rotate on the other side, we observe it again. So this stars relative to the background stars is located right there. So basically we can see the stars uh, move from here to here, right? So in half, uh, six months we move from here to here, right? So that's the uh, kind of a basic math behind this. The reason why we can measure uh, the parallax very precisely, that's because we know the Earth's orbit, uh, orbit very well, uh, very well, very well. So, so this an orbit and the, that orbit basically mimic. They have a very, basically the same shape. The only difference is that the size of the lips so if the stars is really, really nearby, for example, to here, this ellipse will be a big. And if stars are further away, this ellipse will be getting smaller and smaller until, until we, we lost the position, right? So, so this is how we measure uh, parallax uh, in, you know, in paper. In, in, <laughs> in real life, it's not that easy. So for example, here is the uh, nearest stars, uh, which is uh, a Proxima Centauri, is M dwarfs, is the cool stars. 
you can see it's moved across the sky. So it, it is in a pretty crowded field. So uh, as a matter of fact, we don't see that lips here, right? Because the, the proper motion dominate uh, the parallax lips. So most of the time we see it's just moving across the sky. So this is the kind of a, a uh, uh, the plot based on the real data. So this is the first time we uh, we, we track the, uh, the Proxima, uh, uh, Proxima Centauri. So, and this is a ellipse. So we observe at the different apex. So basically what we need to do is we use the, the coordinate because in, on, the, um, on, on earth, we can only measure the relative uh, parallax, basically the parallax relative to the background stars because it will assume all these background stars are really, really uh, far away. So each one of them have a pretty big, tiny, or even a negligible uh, parallax ellipse, right? So we use these background stars as a grid so we can uh, get the, the orbit of, of for uh, nearby stars. Then we do some uh, calculations. We can calculate how fast it moves across the sky and also the, the size of ellipse. So here is the uh, CTIO, uh, Serra Tololo Inter-American Observatory. I've seen many, many nights up there. So we had a program uh, uh, since 1999. It's still ongoing right now. Uh, we have about 100,000 uh, targets we observe. Uh, so averagely, we can observe about uh, 25 targets per night. Uh, so um, as time goes on, because right now Gaia has released uh, you know, billions of stars parallaxes. You may ask why bother, why, why we still uh, continue observing uh, these nearby stars is because we can detect uh, uh, perturbation. So what it means perturbation is, let's say we have um, uh, uh, stars like, like uh, M dwarfs, for example, if the, it has a, a very low mass companion, maybe a, a hot, uh, uh, you know, hot Jupiters or even uh, brown dwarfs, so, um, that M dwarfs will not be static, right? Because it, it both uh, objects will orbit around its uh, center of mass. So that uh, a primary stars will still wobble. And so because it's a long-term observations, we can detect very long period uh, uh, unseen companions, no matter if it's a brown dwarf or, 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 or a hot Jupiter. So, and uh, because we have more than, uh, you know, uh, 20 years of data, so we can detect uh, the orbital periods up to 20 years. Uh, on like a, a Gaia, the Gaia mission it maybe is only like, you know, five to 10 years. So if the um, uh, companion is longer than that, it's really hard to detect. So here's, the, um, so here's a quick test of four meter uh, in CTIO. So all these, uh, I believe this is a, a one meter. Uh, 0.9 meter is not seen here, it's behind this ridge, it's behind, behind it. All these kind of a, now it's become a robotic uh, telescope. All these buildings, as no human beings operate, all are the remote. And this little one, uh, probably you uh, seen data from it before. This is used to be a two mass telescope, a two micron all sky uh, survey telescope is a 1.3 meter telescope. Um, uh, so that is the, the old two mass telescope. All right, so once we get the, uh, the parallax, well, what, what can we use about it? So here is a, a, one of the um, um, fundamental um, uh, diagram in astronomy, which is uh, now we call it a HR diagram or color magnitude diagram. So in the horizontal, horizontal axis, we have a temperature of a star. So hot star is here, cool star is on the right-hand side. So in the vertical axis, uh, we can plot it uh, in absolute magnitude or uh, luminosity. So the bright stars up there, uh, faint stars up down here. And in order to get uh, absolute uh, magnitudes or luminosity, we must have a distance. So that means without a distance, we cannot make this plot. So that's why um, uh, the parallaxes or distance are very important in stellar astronomy. So here's the uh, HR diagram. Now we call it HR diagram. Back then, I don't know how they called it. It's just a diagram uh, made by uh, Henry Russell. He published this uh, uh, diagram in, in Nature uh, back in 1914. Uh, uh, so not a lot of stars there, less than 100 stars, but this is a kind of a sort of a 
first one, quote unquote, uh, HR diagram. So uh, earlier than that, uh, that year, um, uh, uh, Hertzbrand uh, published a, uh, a paper. He also uh, plotted a temperature versus uh, absolute magnitude. You have to you know, rotate this uh, uh, figure a little bit. So here is the temperature again. Uh, is, this is the, uh, yes, this temperature that's absolute uh, magnitude. Uh, this, when, when you Google uh, HR diagram, you, you try to find the old HR diagram, most of the time you see this one, okay? You don't see this one very often. It's really hard to find. And that there are another one's even harder to find, which is um, this one. Uh, this plot is made by Hans Rosenberg. He published this uh, in, um, in a journal uh, back in uh, 1910. Uh, you can see this plot is very similar to a uh, Hertzbrand's plot, right? I just rotate the Hertzbrand's plot. You can see this is Rosenberg's, this is, this is Hertzbrand's. So very similar. So my question for you is, oh, no, I'll, I'll just a second. So. So who, why do we call this HR diagram, Hertzsprung Russell? Why don't we call it the Hans Rosenberg, right? That, that's the question uh, I, I tried to uh, ask here. But before we answer that, so here is a kind of a um, citation records uh, put together uh, by uh, Graham Smith at the Lick Observatory, which is not too far from you guys. Um, so you notice this is the number of citations. The gray line is from, uh, it, astronomers call that diagram, called the Russell diagram, right? You can see the up and down, up and down, right? And uh, back before 1960, some people called it Russell uh, Hussbrun uh, diagram. This is a thick solid line here, it's up and down, up and down, right? So, and somehow uh, in 1950s, uh, the way we called it, you know, HR diagram, Hussbrun Russell diagram kind of uh, uh, picked up the speed. So ever since then, uh, people call this uh, Hussbrun uh, Russell diagram. So. Do we call it Hertzsprung Russell diagram or HR Hans Rosenberg uh, diagram? <laughs> I posed this question to uh, the chair of the WS Historical Astronomy Divisions. This is what he told me, right? You know, not to cosmic justice, one may claim that HR stands for Hans Rosenberg. So either way, we call it HR diagram. We honor all three of them, uh, their pioneering works uh, in uh, stellar astronomy. Right. So. We jump to now, um, talk about the Gaia mission. Uh, so this is the um, uh, telescope launched by a European Space Agency. It launched it back in uh, 2014. Uh, so the goal here is to measure precise coordinate and also precise distance, uh, brightness, and the radio velocity. So for uh, billions with billions of stars, you can see here's the human size. It is, uh, pretty decent size of a telescope. Uh, but this telescope has a um, kind of an unconventional uh, design, right? It is not a, it don't have a, like, unlike Hubble or JWST, which will be launched, uh, you know, less than 30 days, right? Or either Spitzer. So it's just kind of a weird shape, the telescope. It has uh, two mirrors, right? So each one is uh, 1.5 times uh, 0.5 uh, meter size. Here's a comparison, is a human size, that's the mirror. And so basically this telescope will spin, right? Spinning, uh, keep spinning. So you scan the all sky. So basically you use the, um, the image, well, the, the camera will combine image from these two uh, mirrors. And so they can calculate the relative positions. Uh, so I should take my words back. They will measure the absolute position because they don't have, um, unlike we do it on the ground, we do a relative astrometry. What they did here is uh, absolute uh, astrometry. So, so in uh, you have a you know uh, <laughs> this time machine here. You take your time back to uh, April twenty fifth, uh, twenty eighteen, instead of November twelfth, nineteen fifty five. So that was really a big day for especially for stellar astronomer. That's the date they released uh, the Gaia uh, data. They call the DR2, data release number two. So here's what we have. Uh, they released uh, the positions, uh, accurate positions and the brightness of stars for about 1.6 billion stars. 
and then look at this uh, parallel axis, 1.3 uh, billion stars uh, parallel axis. And I also released a very precise photometry in red band and blue bands, as a 1.3 and 1.3 billion stars. So the, there's a tons of data for us to explore. So basically, for stellar astronomers, we are, we stand on on the bottom of a waterfall. There's so many data out there to deal with. So in our team, are really excited. Right to see the results, so we jump on the, uh, the data to check um, have they found the nearest stars? Has the Proxima Centauri been superseded? No, luckily, the Proxima Centauri is still there, still the closest star. Same as the, uh, the Barnard star, right? The Barnard star is still the fastest moving star in the sky, which has about 10 arc seconds per year. So I'm sure at the Barnard should be pretty happy wherever he is right now, in heaven or somewhere. So he must be spouting somewhere. So his Bonner star is still uh, the fastest one. All right, here is the, the HR diagram uh, and, um, based on uh, Gaia's uh, DR2 data release. So here are um, everything within uh, 100 prospects. So you notice here's the uh, color here. Uh, the hot star is here on this side, a uh, cool stars on this side, but the bright magnitudes here. So brighter stars here uh, uh, are here and the fainter stars are here. So we notice here, we call this a man sequence. I believe uh, a few weeks, maybe last year or someone, uh, sometime uh, you, you guys had a talk about the life of the stars or stellar evolution. Uh, I assume you guys are very familiar with uh, this diagram. But uh, here is a, uh, the main sequence. Uh, so these are the dwarfs uh, that consume hydrogen, that convert hydrogen to helium. So here is the sun, where the sun is. And we have uh, white dwarfs, as down here. And uh, we have evolved stars. Those stars uh, used up all the hydrogens in, in their core. Uh, so evolved off the main sequence, become an evolved star, become a, like a, a subgiant or giant, become getting puffier and puffier. And on the other side uh, of the HR diagram, uh, um, yeah, the main sequence uh, are uh, brown dwarfs. So the others are, we call them uh, failed stars, right? They, they, they don't have a, a hydrogen fusion uh, happen in, in the core. So we call it you know, failed star, but they're, they're there. So these are the everything within 100 projects. Uh, so it's a re really rich data but you can also notice there's a, there are a lot of garbages, right? So after the Gaia team or using the, the criterion to scrub the data, so this is much better. So again, these are the white dwarfs, uh, the main sequence and then evolved stars. Uh, you can see, if you see carefully, uh, this, the previous one is better. So here you can see um, very fine details uh, for the, uh, the white dwarf sequence, you can also see the ele elevated uh, main sequence. So these are the um, kind of a, un, un, uh, unresolved binaries. Basically, we have a two uh, equal brightness stars, so uh, their magnitudes are elevated, will be brighter. So we have a, a lot of um, sort of equal brightness uh, binaries elevated here. So these are the uh, binaries. So. So these are the, uh, you know, the beautiful uh, HR diagram. So we cover almost every types. So we have white dwarfs, evolved stars, regular dwarfs, and also uh, uh, brown dwarfs. So you know, we, we, we spent 20 years right, to measure a thousand uh, parallax. Now, Everyone in the world can access billions of stars parallax by using just one simple SQL command, right? Select stars from that, they give you 1.6 billion stars parallax. So basically, the Gaia missions fundamentally transform how we um, study a stellar strong. Right, here's a, again, here's a few highlights uh, for the, um, the Gaia uh, DR2. Uh, these are the uh, White Wolf uh, main sequence. I call the main sequence white dwarf sequence. Uh, you notice uh, there are different bands because they have different atmospheres. 
um, uh, on uh, white dwarfs. And here, on here, you see the um, different clusters because of the ages. They are beautifully plotted here. So it's, uh, we have never seen this kind of uh, data before. And the two days, oh, it's here. So here is a kind of a dramatic comparison, right? In, in, in 1914, we have just less than 100 dots here. Now we have, a, you know, you know, I believe that uh, there are about 300,000 dots within uh, uh, 300 or 700,000. I don't recall exactly, but there's a lot of dots within 100 parsecs after the data being scrubbed. So this is uh, uh, lots of data. All right, two days after uh, the data release, I, I made this plot. Uh, so I noticed there's something funny here. You know, it's that there's a kind of a gap there. Uh, so I don't know what that is. Uh, so I passed this plot to my colleagues. Uh, they were questioning uh, my uh, plotting skills or plotting program. What happened? Or what did you do? Right, so uh, I need to uh, convince them, right? I have to, you know, remake this plot using various plotting programs, but no matter what I use, uh, this gap is still there. So then, then, then the question is, what is that, right? So here's another uh, angle. So here's the kind of a density plot. Uh, so again, this is a HR diagram, right? This color is the absolute magnitude. Uh, here's the gap. So if we bin the data in each vertical strip, so this is what we have here in this, uh, this each uh, uh, panel here represent one strip here, right? And we bin the data vertically. And this red line indicated uh, kind of a, a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian uh, normal distributions along this, uh, this vertical strip. So you notice there's a kind of a under density regions here. So that means that these, uh, uh, they, they, Real, so basically in this histogram, we kind of enhanced uh, uh, this gap. So what, is, what, why we see this gap? So in order to uh, understand it more, so we must ask ourselves, so what happened to Gaia data? Is it possible is a Gaia data has some issue, right? So, so maybe because we want to make this plot, the earlier plot, we need to have a, uh, colors of a star, uh, basically the magnitude of a star and also the distance of a star. So uh, maybe one of those got it incorrectly, right? So because we believe the parallax values, so let's say if we change the photometry, right, if we change to uh, the two mass color, what will happen? So in here in the vertical axis is the K-band magnitudes from two mass. This is the J minus K color in two mass. We also see this kind of a faint gap there, right? So that means, uh, so it has to be astrophysical, right? And not because of the uh, guy of data has some, some uh, problem. And also I passed this uh, a plot to my colleague in uh, Europe. Uh, he's a part of the, the Gaia team. So he confirmed that there's nothing wrong with the Gaia's data release. So then that means uh, the feature is real. So then the next step is we have to find the astrophysical reasons to explain what's, what is going on here. You notice uh, the dashed line, which is the, uh, the predict um, uh, transitions uh, between the partially convective to fully convective stars. So in the past, uh, we, uh, astronomer knows um, there's a kind of a transitions around 0 0.35 solar masses. So, but the, the only, quote that number, but they don't know the exact location of that transition. So based on that uh, estimate masses, I plot it here. I convert that mass to uh, the absolute magnitude. So it's very close, it, although it's not exact, it's very close. So I start to you know, suspect that maybe this gap indicates the transition from the fully uh, um, convective star to a uh, partially convective star. Right, so this plot give, uh, give me a very high confidence to make that uh, uh, conclusion. Uh, this plot is a little bit rich, so let me explain it a little bit. So here is the, um, I, uh, we look at this, uh, the plot from the right to left. So on the right hand side, we have masses. So high mass stars are here, 
So this is a 0 0.5 solar masses. So for one solar mass is way out here, right? So we only look at the low mass region. So the vertical axis is the absolute magnitudes in V band, in the visual band. So different color lines indicate different uh, uh, ages of stars or even uh, different metallicities of stars. They are kind of hand in hand. So you notice this uh, mass, we call this mass luminosity relation. So this mass luminosity relation has a kind of a kink there, right? So then we uh, find the, the slope of this, um, uh, this line this mass luminosity relations for each different lines. So we notice this is a slope changes suddenly and it go back up. So this is in this green line here, it changes and then come back up. So it kind of a transition here, the same with uh, uh, the, uh, the blue line changes transitions. If we connect this um, uh, transitions to here, uh, this is the isochromes. So that is the, where the, uh, the kink is, right? So you kind of, uh, if you connect these three dots, right, one, two, three, the slope is very similar to the gap here. Uh, the gap is hardly C, but the, um, it's, it's there, right? So based on the theorist, they claim the kink is due to the transition from fully convex star uh, to solar type uh, um, uh, interior structures, which is uh, partially convective. That's they uh, claim in back in uh, 2017. So. So we made a very uh, bold uh, conclusion. So basically this gap is linked to the onset of full convection in m dwarfs. That's we uh, made uh, uh, the conclusion. So at, at right after this paper was published, uh, many, many uh, theorists that uh, jump on it, try to explain what is going on. So then the next we will try to, um, to see uh, what happened. All right, here is a quick uh, review for the uh, interior structures of a star. So in the low mass stars, uh, we have a fully convective star. So there are basically three ways to conduct uh, the energy, right? One is a, a convection, uh, like here, and radiation, and, uh, and conducting, right? And unfortunately, in stars, it, it, it's, it's, the stars are, are not a solid body, so it, it cannot conduct uh, heat or conduct energy. There are only two ways. One is convection, the other is radiation. For low mass star, um, we have, uh, uh, they are fully convective. So the transition is around 0 0.35 solar masses. And uh, for, uh, for stars above this uh, limit, we have a kind of a partially convective. Uh, this interior structure is basically it, is the, it's just like the sun. So on the surface is uh, convective, but the, in the core is uh, radiation. But for the very massive stars, they flip it. So this is a, a convective and on the surface is a radiation because convection is pretty effective. And uh, these massive stars, they burn energy so fast, their PP chains start really fast and start ignite the next uh, CNO cycle, the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen cycle. So they need a very uh, efficient way to, uh, to uh, transport the, the energy from interior to exterior. So, uh, so here is the uh, convection. But now we focus on these two uh, types of stars, uh, partially convective and fully convective. Right, again, so this is uh, another way to look at the, uh, the main sequence. So the gap uh, is there. So in our paper, uh, the, below this gap, uh, stars are fully convective and above uh, the gap, uh, stars are partially con convective. So for comparison, the sun is somewhere right there. So basically you can see most of stars in our um, um, galaxy are low mass stars. So about 75% of stars are low mass stars. So for some soul type stars, they, 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 we don't have a lot of uh, soul type stars. Right, so here's a kind of a history um, of the HR diagram. There's many features right, named after famous astronomer uh, we have a Hirschsprung gap. He discovered uh, this gap in back in 1940. So basically, that's the transitions from uh, uh, during the uh, evolved stars uh, evolution. So they will jump from one state to the other. So we it, uh, he called this uh, we call it now um, Hirschsprung gap. We also have a Hayashi track. 
that's the, when the star forms, there's a star formations, it go down this track and fall onto the main sequence. So this is a Hayashi track. And here's a Henye uh, track, basically the stars move down uh, the evolutionary track and try to fall onto the main sequence, then it will move horizontally. So the Henye uh, track will move horizontally then settle onto the main sequence. Here's the main sequence. So is this called <laughs> gel gap? Uh, probably, I, I cannot call this gel cap myself. <laughs> uh, I will let other, other astronomers to decide. But uh, the key thing is here is after 50 more than, uh, than half a century, finally, we have another new feature on the uh, HR, HR diagram, which has some uh, astrophysical uh, meaning. You will see that in the next few slides. Right, here's a kind of a quick review for um, the nuclear fusions in, happen inside the core of the star. So we have a PP chain here. Um, so this, uh, we uh, combined uh, uh, two protons into uh, uh, helium. Right? Of course, there are many steps in between. So protons combine two protons to become a deuterium, uh, combine the protons and the deuterium become a helium-3. And release some gamma and you know, electrons, neutrinos, all, all these you know, energy uh, particles. And after that, uh, three heliums, uh, here's the helium three uh, interior structures, and we have two protons, one neutron. We combine these two, become a, a helium four. That's the, an ordinary helium we see in the universe. We have uh, uh, two, uh, two protons, two, two neutrons. So it will release quite a bit of uh, energy. So then, of course, the next step is the, the PP2 chain. Uh, we don't need to know this at this moment. And uh, those theorists uh, dig into the um, uh, stellar evolution during this phase, um, the PP chain. Uh, they, they notice a few things for, uh, pretty interesting. Um, here is the, the plot. The plot is pretty rich. Let me explain this a little bit. Uh, the horizontal axis is the, the age of the star. And the vertical uh, axis uh, has many uh, parameters, including the luminosity, and we'll skip that, it's not important, and the radius of the star, this line here, and the core, uh, temp uh, the core temperature, and also the helium-3 abundance. So uh, this model is for 0.35 solar masses. Uh, it's a pretty typical metallicity. So this is what happened inside of a star. Uh, with a mass of, of uh, 0.35 solar mass. So first we look at this uh, radius uh, curve first. So you notice when stars form, right? Uh, the, uh, molecular clouds, um, those the portal stars, right? Collapse. So they've, uh, they've initially they're a giant, pretty big, right? They collapse. So they can see this uh, curve uh, go down here. Once they uh, shrink to a certain size, they will ignite uh, the PP chain. So the core temperature will increase uh, dramatically. So at some point, uh, so they all three will start uh, to react, right? All three uh, reactions uh, will start. So as the uh, temperature, because that the mass of these stars, these kind of stars, not massive enough. So the third step is not that efficient compared to the uh, second step. So basically, it's a kind of competition between this one and that one. And uh, so you can see here the open area indicates the uh, radiative uh, zone and the hashes indicates the convection. So you notice this uh, convection zone uh, in increase, right? And the radiation zone uh, decrease because the temperature drops because this one needs pretty high uh, uh, temperature inside of the core, but this second step doesn't need that uh, high temperature. As the temperature drops, this kind of uh, getting less efficient. So that's why we have a lot of uh, helium-3 being accumulated in the core. And also the radiative zone can, uh, is shrinked with time. At some point, the outer layers and the inner layer were mixed. So basically it will dilute uh, the, the helium-3 being formed. So then suddenly the temperature uh, increases again. So this steps will dominate. So you can see the radiative zone uh, start to form back again and then gradually uh, decrease. And uh, these two layers mixed again and the radiation zone. So you have a kind of a cycle. So here's what happened inside of a core. So the core is here. So this is the radiative zone. 
So this is the, this uh, white area. And on the top is, uh, on the outside is a convective surface, uh, a convective zone. So you can see this layers, uh, this transition zone and that transition zone will kind of uh, uh, contact each other once this, uh, the, these two layers merges. That's what happened here. So this is what happened inside the star to cause the, that kind of uh, uh, the gap. So the next uh, slides will give you a better picture to, uh, about that gap. So here's a very similar uh, uh, plot uh, in the horizontal axis indicates the age of a star. Uh, we can ignore this one because this is about the helium-3 uh, abundance. On the top of this one is, uh, uh, is the radius uh, of the star. And on the bottom is the, the, um, the size of a radiative zone, which is the, this red uh, uh, line here, uh, red region here. You notice the stars uh, shrink, right, as it uh, settled onto the main sequence. And the, at some point, uh, the stars, the star radio will increase. You notice this um, below some uh, threshold, uh, they never form this kind of uh, uh, instability. You notice here, so for a star with a 0.3 solar masses, the radiative zones formed right around 100 million years old. So then they disappear because they just don't have a, a large mass to, to start the next, the third steps, right? Uh, so this radiative zone just uh, 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 is faded away. So 0.32 solar masses, again, it forms pretty large and fades away. And then 0.34, it is okay, it's large enough. So these have the kind of a pulsations, like a damping effect. And since a few billion years, it run out for the energy. So, so that uh, uh, radiative zone disappear. But for a star, it's pretty massive. Once they form radiative zone, they stay there. So you look at this, this is the radiative zone. They, they never disappear, right? And for the 0 0.36 uh, solar masses, these pulsations can last a very, very long time up to 10 billion years, or even as old as the age of the, um, the universe. So this is quite exciting. So this kind of effects uh, astronomers, uh, Ben Centers and uh, Pinsonot uh, call this a con convective kissing uh, instability. Basically this layers and the that layers will kiss each other. So this layer and that will kiss and the radiative zone disappear. So this is um, how the theorists uh, explain that gap. So basically the stars will move, uh, for star here, they'll move up and down when they uh, go through that instability phases. Sometimes they go down here and then move up, back up. Uh, so that's why, oh, sorry, this one. So um, that's why there's a low density in this region because you can notice there's a lot of stars. You can regularly see, you will see the um, much clearer picture next. Uh, there are uh, a few stars being piled up here right above the gap because the most of stars stay there. And then they go down here and come back up, go down here and come back up to do this kind of pulsation. You notice um, the, the pulsation periods are really, really long. Uh, uh, it's not like um, uh, the uh, giant stars or even those, all those evolved stars. Uh, they pulsate, the pulsating period is really, really fast. Uh, so basically, uh, these kind of M dwarfs are very unique uh, among all the main sequence dwarfs. So, because no other M dwarfs go through this kind of a pulsation period. So um, a theorist um, are very happy to see this gap because this is what they, uh, they say in their paper, uh, just a small gap in the column magnitude diagram could thus provide a deep insight into the interior structure of a low mass star. So in the past, um, they don't have a sort of a, uh, a features can they test the, the interior structures. Uh, because of that, this gap, they can test uh, their model. Uh, in the past, uh, they only see the, the final result, right? How many um, uh, the flux being emitted uh, uh, from the surface, right? They don't, don't know, we don't know what happened inside our star. Because of this gap, they can test their model. So what is the next for this project? The few questions uh, we need to ask is, um, uh, we'll go through each bullet uh, one by one, is can we reproduce the main sequence from model? Um, this is the paper uh, I had with my colleague. Uh, we uh, 
kind of a, uh, generate um, millions of stars uh, theoretically and populate on the main sequence. So in order to gen this one, we have to um, use the best theory and models we have right now. So to reproduce the HR diagram, again, this is the, the color, the vertical axis, the ma absolute magnitude. So this um, uh, kind of a dark red line here is uh, based on empirical result. That's the, what we observe from Gaia, right? So here is the, the dark line is where the gap is. You notice the model is stars really blue, right? About half uh, magnitude bluer than the, what we observed. And the gap, even though they can explain the cause of the gap, but the, the location of gap still miss a little bit, it's not perfect, which means they still have rooms to, uh, to improve. Uh, so that means, as uh, Baraf and Xavier uh, mentioned in the earlier slides, right, uh, the gap can be used to calibrate all the models. So there are stellar, stellar evolutionary models and also the interior structure model. So that is the, uh, the next step uh, theorists uh, can do. So mm -hmm. the other question is what kind of a dynamo models is, is for these gap stars? The dynamos try to explain the magnetic activities at the surface, right? So here is the, um, uh, the structure is very similar to the sun, right? So we have a, we know we have a, a sunspot at the surface. We have a lot of solar activities and uh, in, in, you know, theorists, uh, they, they propose a model called uh, alpha omega dynamos to explain all these magnetic activity at the surface. And for uh, the cooler stars, Right, cooler indoors, they are fully convective. Uh, they propose uh, you know, omega squill uh, dynamos to explain uh, the magnetic activities. But how about these guys, right? They're very unique. And uh, you notice they, they have three layers, right? Not just two. Uh, so in this transitions, uh, the solar physicists call this uh, transition as the tachocline. Uh, it's known right here, tachocline. But for these gap stars, they have not just one, they have two tackle clines, if we call this the second one as tackle cline, right? So there's two layers of transitions and then they do pulsate, right? Sometimes they are fully convective, even though it's a very short amount of time, split a second, I don't know how, how long it takes, but really, really fast, it bounces back to here, right? They do pulsate. So it's, it's in some sense, in, interior structure is not stable. So what happened to their surface, right? What kind of activities on the surface? We don't know. Do we need another dynamo models to explain these kind of stars? Uh, well, we don't know. So this is uh, another question we, we try to answer. Uh, of course, the other is the you know, exact uh, mass range of this transition. These are, these are the three papers um, you know, um, talk about the transitions. So you can see that the mass range is uh, very different uh, from model to model. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they all use different kind of initial conditions. They have they, their own proprietary, you know, uh, uh, secret in ingredients, if you want to say that, to produce this, uh, the model. But the, they have very kind of a different uh, mass range. So what is the exact mass range? So the only way to solve that is, you know, we you know, detect uh, directly use empirical value. We try to measure the empirical masses. So here are the four examples. And I observed um, even now, I try to resolve uh, the closed binaries and try to map out orbits. You know? uh, so here's the result from uh, Gemini North and Gemini South. So these are the uh, very uh, close uh, stars. The suppression is about 0 0.2 uh, arc seconds. Uh, we can convert it to AU is about seven AU. So all these uh, try to map out the orbit. And someday we can you know, get uh, more empirical uh, values for, the, uh, for these uh, stars. So the next one, also the one I'm working on right now is, uh, you know, uh, we know we need, uh, the interior structures, their interior structures are not stable, right? So what happened? Can we see that in, 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 uh, in, uh, in terms of photometry or, in a, in a spectrum. So here I select a few stars, right, close to the gap. Uh, so this is the enhanced HR diagram. You can notice the white area indicates the gap. So there's a kind of over density there. 
So I, I specifically select a few stars in this region. So we can compare stars above the, the gap, in the gap, and the below the gap to see uh, the, their stellar activities. These are the data from a, a test mission. So these are the number A, the A label A indicates the that stars, um, B is that, and the C is that. You notice the number, uh, the uh, star A has kind of an unusual activities. This is not um, pretty, um, you know, stable, uh, some activity there. And for number, uh, so star B is as a flare. So that means it has some activity at the surface. And for star C, right there, you can see the, the spot's rotation. That's the, uh, uh, basically there's a spot that rotate in and out of the, uh, of the uh, tested field of view. So you can see, um, this is a, maybe there are some stars here have some more activity, activities, we just don't know. Uh, so after I analyze 5,000 light curves, hopefully I, can, I will get an answer. So the other uh, companion project is to get the H alpha uh, emissions. So basically, the goal here to uh, to get uh, uh, to obtain as many spectrum as possible to analyze the H alpha activity because H alpha activity happens in the photosphere or coma sphere. So that can be an indicator for the the activity. So this is what I have so far. This is uh, hot from press. This is I just uh, processed this uh, last week. So we have about 218 stars being observed. So uh, surprisingly, we only have A star shows the H alpha activity. So all of them are kind of uh, here, nothing below this gap. Uh, this is kind of a surprise. I still need to analyze more. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, so here's the H alpha emissions pretty strongly for these guys, but um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I still have about uh, um, 200 more stars to go. Uh, so hopefully we can get more uh, better pictures uh, and to understand what is going on with uh, the, for the, why we have so many stars not active. All right, so the next one, um, uh, this is the paper I put out last year. Uh, basically I use some uh, algorithm to enhance the HR diagram to, make, uh, to let some features more prominent. Uh, so again, uh, this uh, the main sequence uh, is the, the dark region means over density, right? And the white region means under density uh, from the Gaussian uh, Gaussian uh, distributions. Uh, here is the I, I call it backbone of the main sequence. You notice the gap is right there. Uh, the uh, black region that's the over density, right? Because stars stay there most of the time. They move down, go back up. They stay there most of the time. There's one feature um, we still don't know what is going on is that one. Uh, you can see there's a, a kind of a teardrop shape there, low density. Uh, that feature is real. Uh, no matter uh, we analyzed uh, the Gaia DR2 data or Gaia's early data release, uh, uh, EDR3, which is called uh, early data release number three. So no matter what I did, uh, that uh, teardrop shape is still there. Uh, my colleague is, is a theorist. Um, he has no answer for me. So uh, that feature is still pending. Uh, hopefully someday we can figure out why th there's a low density right there. So I call it the Da Vinci code in HR diagram. Um, so what we have learned, uh, so astronomy is fundamental. And in this cartoon, the astronomical pyramid, uh, shows the astrometry is on the bottom because we, we determine distance and the accurate coordinates of the sky. And the, the result will be applied to a uh, photometrist or spectroscopist. And also, you know, if we want to study the uh, stellar atmospheres, interior structures, we must know the distance uh, of those stars. Of course, you may know a term called distance letters, right? We have to determine uh, stars, in nearby stars first, right? We apply it um, the distance to stars you know, further away. And so like, we measure the Cepheus in our uh, galaxy, right? Once we know the Cepheus, because they are variable stars, once if we detect Cepheus in other galaxy, we can apply it, you know, ex sort of extrapolate, right? To determine the distance for other, uh, uh, to other galaxies. So 
that's why astrology is fundamental. It's very important. And then next is many questions yet to be answered. So stay tuned. Uh, hopefully I can find the answer someday. And finally, uh, it's very important. I love Gaia. There's, there's, uh, there's tons of data there uh, for me uh, and for us to explore. And uh, that, that's it. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Zhao. It was wonderful. Uh, amazing amount of data and a lot of observations. I'm very impressed. Um, you mentioned early, uh, if we can take a few questions here. Um, you talked about using some of the uh, uh, Gaia data, I think for, no, it wasn't the Gaia data, but for uh, discovering long period exoplanets, the so 20 year plus, uh, uh, what's come out of that? Uh, have you? Can't hear you. Oh, yes. All right. So um, we, we found many uh, uh, stellar companions and some uh, brown dwarfs. Uh, the exoplanets uh, 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 is, uh, is harder because uh, the precision. So uh, in order to solve that problem, uh, currently we have a project. We try to combine our data and the Gaia data. Of course, Gaia data is not, hasn't, the full catalog hasn't been released. They only released a partial data. So in, I think they were released in five years from now. So we are kind of a, a set up a system so we can combine our uh, parallax data versus um, and uh, the Gaia data. Once we combine them, uh, we can uh, kind of uh, extend the, uh, not just the timeline, also the precision. So we can detect the uh, 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 beat down the arrows, basically. Okay. Any any other questions? Uh, just to comment on the uh, issue of the longitude act of seventeen fourteen. Uh, for those who aren't aware, there's actually a wonderful book called uh, Longitude by Davos Sobel. I think it is. Came out about ten or fifteen years ago. Just a wonderful book that uh, has the account of. Uh, the discovery of longitude. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so I'd highly recommend that to uh, people that are interested. Yeah, that, that's quite a fascinating study. It, uh, it's all about the, the British circumnavigating the earth and establishing their empire and so forth by relating wherever their ships were to London. Yes. Uh, to the prime meridian. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really intriguing to uh, search back into history and uh, find uh, that connection. It's, I've always been very interested in that. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> I just want to know if you come back and tell us when you discover what, what's in that teardrop, because I'm curious. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I, I will. Uh, that teardrop, does, I, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> is there any speculation you have on what it is? And the uh, no. fuzzy, uh, fuzzy thinking uh, wild theories or? That was is, is tough. I, I don't even have a speculation for that. Even my, my colleagues uh, doesn't have one. It's just okay. I don't know what happened. So um, <clears throat> the classification of stars uh, within one hundred within one hundred parsecs is that what you were? Yes, one hundred parsecs. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, is there any indication? Uh, obviously, it's they're going to be quite different uh, in globular clusters and stars that formed uh, earlier in the life of the galaxy and so forth. But in terms of uh, other locations in the spiral arms and in the star forming regions, is it is this fairly is this considered to be fairly typical? Uh, pretty much everywhere in the galaxy in the in the H uh, two star forming regions or in the uh, uh, in the spiral arms, you mean the the gap? Um, well, I'm I'm speaking about the the general classification of oh, stars yes. as they fit yes. on the HR diagram. Yes, yes, yes. The, the universal. No matter where you go, is a local galaxy or other uh -huh. extragalactic uh, objects. So the, that HR diagram can be applied to everywhere. So even the uh, the globular clusters. So the so oh, globular clusters too. Yes, uh, yes. So. Um, 
would it uh, would it apply specifically to stars within a particular age range? Obviously, uh, once yes, uh, once we change the metallicity or ages, the shape of the slope will change a little bit. Because the, the plot I show you is stars within a uh, hundred parsecs, most of them are, are pretty uh, uh, young. Turkey. Uh, one thing is people really cook it pretty much once a year, so you don't kind of learn the mistakes and then. What? Are you hearing <laughs> some extraneous sound? <laughs> yes. So yeah, for the uh, stars in the global clusters, because they, they tend to be old, their last, um, we call it a metal pool. So yes. their uh, HR diagram will be so slightly different. Those are thought to be about, what, about 10, 10 to 13 billion years old, or is, are yeah, they? They're old, yeah, yeah, they're, they're old, maybe they're, they're as old as our galaxy, because they're formed first, those goblet clusters, they're formed yes. first, yeah. So uh, the general, you know, the distribution is still there, right? The main sequence, we have white worlds, we have evolved stars, but the, the, the slope will changes because once we change the uh, the metallicity, the luminosity will changes. So basically, the slope will move uh, move up and down depends on the metallicity of those. Uh, ah, the metallicity, areas. yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yep. You're welcome. Anybody have anything else? Well, if not, then. Uh, oh. Go ahead, Marion. You muted. We lost your voice. You muted. I thought I unmuted and I double tapped. <laughs> so the question was, uh, how much more data was a guy going to collect over the or its life? You've collected 1.6 billion data points yeah, or think, something uh, like that. I What's think, the ultimate goal? I think the know? goal is about two billions. Okay. Yeah. It's getting there because right now the reason why it, the number is lower than expected are those uh, very bright stars are those really, really faint stars. Those are the tough part and also the binaries because currently their model, uh, when they calculate all the astro astrometric solutions, their model is optimized for single stars, not for double stars. Yeah, double stars really, really hard because we, we see this kind of a move movement because the Gaia has pretty low re resolution, they only see the center of mass wobbling, right? So you want to model that, it's really hard when you have uh, many, many stars. Is there gonna be any correction for that to give it a uh, better resolution or? Uh, no, the resolution, or? yeah, the resolution cannot be, it is fixed. Uh, we cannot change that. The only way to do it is once they have a, get a more, uh, so basically they have to kind of run through few iterations. So as they assume that star is a single star, they process the data and to check the residuals, right? If stars has high residuals, they go to another round to see it does a, because a, a just a stars flares or something, or is a double, right? If the double stars, they do go through another iterations to solve the, the basically the orbital motion of the, of yeah. the centric goal. Yeah. Okay, I seem to remember that the binary stars were a large fraction of the stars out there, I don't know, 50% or? Uh, yes, that's for the, the more massive stars, we have more binaries. For the M dwarfs, the binary fraction raised about 30%. 30%, so it's, yes. uh, you're, there's probably uh, some interesting things hidden in the binary stars given their yes. Yes. high percentage of the uh, solar yes. population that, uh, is there a plan to uh, Gaia 2 that will have better resolution uh, to look at that population? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that will be a, a long term, right? So, <laughs> okay. So, you notice when, the, when folks discover actual planets, you notice most of the whole stars is a single star, majority of them. Yeah. yeah. Because that's easier for them, right? So, single, a single whole stars. That many many planets orbit around it as easier. Once you have a double stars, and you have a planet, that's a three body solution, right? That that is really hard to solve. So okay. when, when when those are planet hunters, when they see a binaries, they Mommy, remove them. Maybe it's because you're so. When uh, 
kind of refresh me. I think you said when you measure the binary stars, they, they look like a one object that's what an average of the two stars, or can you detect which binaries are actually evenly matched in terms of luminosity or whatever, yes. yeah. or, or disparate uh, characters like a, a dwarf and a super white? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So for uh, you want to get um, the binaries, there's a few ways, right? First is just easier way, just like I did. I use high resolution techniques using speckle camera to resolve it. Do I have a single dot or two dots? That's the, 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 once I resolve it, that's easier. The two dots, you roll it around. If we have just one single uh, stars, it's not resolved by using any ground-based uh, you know, high resolution techniques, then we need to use uh, spectroscopic resolution techniques. Basically, we get the radio velocities, we get a spectrum. Do we see a uh, single lines, the lines moving back, back and forth, Doppler effects, or just, a, or that's for a, a, a double line spectroscopic binary, or a single line means that the companion is too faint. We don't see any spectral features. We only have one line here, but because the, the, the still in the binary system, so the, the one of the stars will moving, the feature will moving back and forth because of Doppler effect. So we know, okay, that is a binary star. Yeah, that's how we uh, detect the binary. So, so unfortunately, if we use the, the spectroscopic methods, we cannot get uh, the, the, the accurate masses, I should say. The, the way they do this, they only can determine the minimum masses, okay? Because in the radial velocity, let's say here is the, um, do I have a sample? Yeah. So let's say here's the, the orbital plane, right? Right. So if it's the perpendicular to the sky is 90 degrees, we don't see Doppler effects at all, right? Because it moves up and down, right? If we do it this way, we, we can't detect, as long as it has a tilt, slightly tilted, we have the uh, Doppler effect. Sure. But there's like ambiguity, right? Because, because there are different distances from, from the earth. Yeah. Yeah, they move toward you or away from you. They're doing this kind of ellipse, right? Sometimes moving toward you, moving away from you. But they don't, they, in the radial velocity, they don't know the, the orbital plane. What they did is moving this way. They don't know the inclination. So what they measure is M sine I. Basically, it's the minimum masses if they only use the spectroscopic method to detect the binary star. So it's M sine I, so I is the inclination of the orbit. So basically they, what they measure is the minimum masses. They, they can, because they don't know the inclination of the, the orbit. In order okay. to get the inclination of orbit, there are only two ways to, to get it. One is we resolve the orbit, uh, the system directly, which the one I use, the one I show you, you see two dots, the orbit around each other. So that's the way we can determine the inclination of the orbit. Or we we'll use Gaia's data because Gaia data can give us the photocentric orbit. So basically you can know how the orbit incline in the sky. So that's how we determine the masses and, um, and do all those analysis relative to the exoplanets. Okay, so doing these spectral analysis, you may be using a combination of Gaia data or some of your direct individual observations? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that the ideal case is we combine all everything. Yeah. <laughs> I only okay. get once and we can, uh, you know, search any, you know, available data out there because all these uh, nearby stars have been observed many, many times, right? Throughout the years. I mean, observe, uh, astronomers observe here for, you know, a couple of years, maybe he thinks it's boring. No, he, he doesn't care about it because he only follow it for maybe three years, right? So it's not sexy, right? For three years, it's hard to, hard to get funded, right? You have to make you know really sexy top, topic and then get funding. But what if that star has a long period planet, 10 years? Once we combine Gaia data, we can piece everything together, right? So in, th in three years, we see this kind of movement, but in Gaia, we have another one. We combine it to see, do we see a long period? So basically we have to fit everything. In order to uh, you know to improve um, uh, the detection rate, right? And what uh, it's kind of an offshoot of that, I guess. Uh, talk about you know twenty-year periods or whatever. What's sort of the maximum p 
period of uh, that you might go to? Is that unbounded uh, in essence? It, it depends on how, how long we have observed that target. That that that, that I should say that some. Some folks, uh, you know, ver for those very, very nearby stars, people start to observe it way back in 1950, right? We have those data available, 50s or 60s. Okay. Even though the precision is not that high, but the data- You've got some data. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so as we collect data going forward, it all just oh, kind yeah. of builds on itself. Uh, yes. We get a, yeah. a better and yeah. better model uh, yeah. Yeah. as and we go stars forward in time. Pl uh, planets or, or brown dwarfs closer to the star are going to have like these shorter periods so it's the it's the bigger ratio if you remember from some of the other talks see you know, uh one of the reasons we find so many of these close uh brown dwarf or or hot jupiter planets is because those are the fastest to detect I mean, it doesn't take you many years but like stuff out in, in jupiter or saturn or uranus they're you know, that takes them a really long time to cross back and front and do the yeah. observation. So, so those you can only find with large amounts of data. And, you know, yeah. Mel, we've, we've only, we only got about to the fifties at the, at the best, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Well, it seems like you've got a lot of work ahead of you potentially. Oh uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. How large of a data set. Yes. Are you using the, uh, from the data analysis standpoint, like, you know, you process, this data, the 1.6 billion stars, when you do the full selection, uh, uh, that sounds like a, a big data problem. Are you, uh, do you uh, employ well, was, uh, data scientists? Or are you doing this directly? Uh, 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 okay, so when Gaia released their data, they put it in a nice, uh, you know, uh, in a database sort of, which is retrieve the data. So then they, we scrub it. So we use some criteria and in, you know, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the SQL, right? We use set up some criteria. You know, the error has to be uh, greater than, uh, less than certain values. You know, uh, some uh, criteria we have to meet. We, so we query that. We get a, a set of data. We need to analyze that. So, but in the in the Gaia team, of course, they have many many you know um, uh, astronomers uh, to process the data and uh, do the you know the hard work uh, to model because that's really hard. They have to model everything because the whole in, in, there's one mission I did not mention, which is the Hipparchus mission. That, that was launched back in uh, 1989. That was the precursor of the Gaia mission. Uh, that Hipparchus mission measured precise uh, distance and coordinates for stars brighter than about 11th magnitude. So there's very limited st stars be, be measured back then. But th at that time, the Hipparchus mission set up the, the fundamental uh, astrometric grid in the sky. But now it's Gaia's error. So when Gaia determined their coordinate grid, so they tied up their, um, their grid to the quasar because the quasar doesn't move at all. So which means, so when they build up the grid, they have to link their data point to the radio telescopes the coordinate to set up the whole grid. In that case, they need a lot of, uh, you know, sort of data scientists and so on to, to solve that problem. Yeah, I, I could certainly Great. see um, AI coming into combing through the data yeah. uh, or looking for certain things that we know, but you can't use AI for the unknown because right. you can't train it. So, <laughs> yeah, yes. You could, like, you may never have found that gap if you didn't use your visual plot, if you're just relying on AI because right. you wouldn't know to look for it. Maybe. Yes. That's correct. And also you notice I have uh, about 5,000 light curves need to be processed to detect the flares and the rotations. Basically I use sort of um, uh, in, in a, so AI there. So basically I, we use a package, we train uh, the predetermined flares. You use that feature, you know, apply to other light curves to detect a flare because I, I don't want to go through it one by one for 5,000 <laughs> light curves. I yeah. identify that one by one. So, I use sort of, um, sort of machine learning techniques to you know, pick up those flares and you know, decide which one has a rotation, which one has a flare. Cool. Well, I, I just want to thank you for the great lecture as well. That was very, very cool, very enjoyable, very and super interesting. Uh, uh, I think most of us are familiar with the Herschel uh, Russell diagrams and, and these lights, but, but the fact that you guys found this gap and, and, and figured out what it is is super cool. Very, <laughs> really, really like that. That was, yes. uh, yeah. 
I, I, I was really excited when I first see that. And when I passed to my colleagues in the first place, that nobody believes it. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it took me uh, quite a while to convince them. I said, ah, Wei Chen, did you do something wrong here? Are you drunk? <laughs> what happened? Programming error. It's got to be a programming, <laughs> programming error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, but the other thing that surprised me is the Gaia team has more than 200 astronomers. None of them <laughs> see that feature. If you um, uh, oh. check their original population, uh, that gap is there. They just don't notice that. You know, so because I, this is my, um, my main uh, sort of playgrounds, that's where I do my research. So I'm very familiar with the, the HR diagram inside out. So once I plot all the data on the HR diagram, I noticed that gap, you know, you notice that two days after, right? Yeah, right away. <laughs> right away. But, you know, so the Gaia team, they, uh, they had about uh, six months to do their, um, you know, proprietary uh, analysis so they can publish their hot, sexy. Right, they get to first. go first. Yeah, they get the first tip first, right? So, but then they missed that. <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great job. Two, two days, two days of looking and you found it. Sheesh. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, thank you uh, so You're much welcome. again. Uh, just kind of a, a wonderful talk and uh, amazing discovery. And I appreciate uh, you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. I know it's getting late. Uh, no problem. Not where yeah. you are. Yeah. yeah.